there's a tremendous amount of influence in this room. And I'm not referring to the individuals that have already been introduced. Teachers, these folks know your influence, and it's important that tonight we take this opportunity to be informed about the issues so that we can share our concerns and have our voice heard as we move forward this, with this special session that's, that's before us. I would like to back up just for a few minutes before I introduce our speaker to put in context why we're here. As many of you know, the governor commissioned an audit to be performed. That audit was released at the end of August by the PFM group. That audit provided some recommendations to the legislator. Now, it's important to remember that was a recommendation. This is not a bill. It's not a proposed bill. There was a lot of concern that derived because of that audit because it called for recommendations that you probably are aware of, probably part of the reason you're here, uh, eliminating COLAs, 401K, Social Security for new hires, uh, 401K for actually current employees, and then increasing the age to 65 for all those that will retire in the future. That caused some alarm. You couple that with some of the rhetoric out of Frankfurt, so there's, there's room and reason for concern. Uh, I've, I've spoken personally with several teachers that have concerns. I've spoken with our legislators. The good news is, as I mentioned, that audit is just a recommendation. And further good news is that we have legislators locally that have traditionally been supportive of public education. The expectation by us, and I'm sure you, is that will continue, and, and I'm sure that it will as we go forward. But again, there are many leader in me schools here in, in the, the three schools that are represented, the three school districts, and one of the important things that we talked about and we teach our kids is seek first to understand. That's the focus tonight. That's why we are here. That's why we have Mr. Barnes here, so that we can distinguish the differences between the Kentucky retirement system and the part of that that is the Kentucky teachers retirement system. So as we look ahead, we have the audit, we have Senator Bowen that is the co-chair of the public oversight of the pension committee. So he's, he has an instrumental voice in crafting that piece of legislation that is rumored to be proposed for the special session in November. So that's what is ahead of us. Moving back to the point tonight, getting that information, developing our voice, developing the talking points that we need so that we can share those with the individuals that represent us that you have on the back of the agenda that's going around. At the conclusion of the presentation by Mr. Barnes, we do have two microphones in the front. If you have a comment or if you have a question, you're welcome to come forward at the conclusion and share that, and I encourage you to do so. With that being said, I would like to introduce our guest this evening and our speaker. Bo Barnes serves as the Deputy Executive Director of Operations and General Counsel of the Teacher Retirement System. He has been with the retirement system since 1999. Prior to joining TRS, Mr. Barnes served in the Kentucky Department of Financial Institutes, the Kentucky Cabinet for Health Services, and in the private practice of law. Mr. Barnes attended the University of Kentucky where he received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Political Science and a Juris Doc Doctorate degree. In 1991, he was admitted to practice law in the state of Kentucky. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bo Barnes. First, um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me here this afternoon to talk to you about your retirement system, the teacher's retirement system, or TRS. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to talk directly to our memberships about their retirement system. And I will echo what Superintendent Esther said, and that is that TRS is a very unique retirement system compared to Kentucky retirement systems. Uh, we are more comparable to other uh, retirement systems in other states than we are to KRS. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of confusion sometimes in the media reports about 
whether they're talking about KRS or TRS. We get a lot of calls sometimes because there's a lot of confusion. So tonight, um, I'm just going to give you some various slides that give you some uh, background information on your retirement system that help give you some facts, some information, the truth, and uh, that will be useful to you, hopefully. And then uh, I might talk just a little bit about where we are right now. I think Superintendent S has co covered most of that about with the PFM group and where we're headed. I might add just a few more comments to that. And then, of course, after that, I welcome questions from this group uh, about their retirement system. So with that, let's begin. Um, <clears throat> first, TRS was established by an act of the General Assembly in 1938. We opened our doors for business in 1940. Uh, teachers were not included in Social Security when that federal program was established in 1935. So TRS was established as a Social Security replacement plan, and we remain so today. Just a few bullet points here. Over 50,000 individuals receive benefits from TRS. TRS pays out $166 million a month uh, in, retirement, in retirement checks, just the pension, that monthly check that teachers get. Uh, the average benefit is about $38,000 a year, and keep in mind, that has to replace Social Security plus provide for some measure of retirement. This slide is, uh, before I get into this, TRS is a long-term investor. Our investment horizon is not one, three, five, even ten years. Our investment horizon is 30 plus years. And I have a uh, slide later on that shows some historical returns uh, on our investments. But nevertheless, uh, TRS has just come off a very good year with its investments. In fact, 15.37% returns for the fiscal year ending June 30th. That has us in about the top 8% in the nation in investment returns. It's great news. It's just one year, but it, it, it's a great year. Our internal investment staff, and we have a lot of internal investment staff managing your money. We have chartered financial analysts with decades worth of experience that work in-house for TRS. We also have outside experts and an outside investment consultant. They did a great job. They did a fantastic job with your money this year. So we're very appreciative of that. I want to point something out here. You'll see that says gross investment return. Uh, just to explain what that means. A gross return means that we haven't subtracted out from that number the, all the expenses that we pay to invest your money. So the investment managers, the lawyers, the accountants, the investment consultant, the custodial bank, all those folks that get paid to invest your money. The good news here is that TRS negotiates among the lowest investment fees in the nation. Uh, so even when you subtract out all those fees we have to pay to manage all that money, it would still be 15.02% return for the year. So really, really good year. I'm really appreciative of our investment folks for, for what they were able to accomplish. Uh, that has uh, TRS, you know, uh, in the last three of the last five years, we had double-digit returns. Five of the last eight years, we had double-digit returns. So good news on investment side, really good news. And you see uh, the yellow bars going left to right. Those show the amount of assets that TRS has under management. You see at the far right hand, that's where we are today as of the June 30th, uh, 2017. So we had over $19 billion dollars under management. That's the most we've ever had under management uh, to pay for your retirement allowances. This slide is an actuarial slide. It's got a lot of numbers on it. I'm just going to concentrate on a few. <clears throat> the first number I want to concentrate on is the upper right hand corner under the word percent. You'll see 54.6 percent. That is the funded status of the pension fund as of June 30th, 2016. We don't have the final reconciled audited numbers for 2017 yet. They will be available later in the year. But for June 20th, I mean June 30th, 2016, we had a 54.6% uh, funded status for the pension fund. So what does that mean? Well, that means that as of June 30th, 2016, we had 54.6% of all the assets that we needed to pay for all the retirement benefits that had already been earned by every retired and every active teacher, okay? 
what we want to do, and the goal of every pension fund, is to start building that percentage up out there 30 years down the road to 100% funded. That's the target. And so that's what we're trying to do is to move that up so that one day we'll have 100% of all active retired uh, teachers' benefits fully funded. Uh, and at that point, uh, the cost of the retirement system is very cheap. It's about the same cost as Social Security, but it's a better benefit. It's a more efficient benefit. Uh, we actually have dollars, I mean, investments in, you know, stocks, real estate, timberland. Uh, we make private loans to banks. So we, we are able to achieve returns, and it's those returns that pay the lion's share of every retiree's retirement allowance. It's a pre-funded benefit with a defined benefit pension plan. You'll see just to the left of the 54.6%, 14,531, and, and that's in millions, so that's the actual size of the unfunded liability, $14.5 billion as of June 30th. Now, that's a big number, but the good news is we don't owe all of that right now. We're going to be paying retirement benefits, these liabilities are owed now for decades. So for that teacher who just retired and is going to live another 30 years, those benefits are going to be paid out over those decades. For the teacher in his or her late 20s who has five years of service and one day would be able to uh, retire that account, uh, decades away from paying that. But we do want to start paying off that $14.5 billion, again, over a 30-year period. It's kind of like paying off a home mortgage. You don't have to do it right now. You're not worried if you're not having to pay it off right now, but you do want to, we do want to start making those payments and get that paid off uh, in, entirely. There's a number just below the 54.6%, uh, and I'm almost reluctant to bring it up because I'm going to tell you to forget it, but sometimes it's reported uh, publicly in you know, social and uh, other media, and uh, that number is a different funded status number, and it's not one that actuaries use. Actuaries would say, ignore it. Actuaries use the 54.6% to plot that path for our budget request to, at one day, that follow that path, that target of 100% funded. The smaller number is a number that is required by an entity. It's a nonprofit entity called the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or GASB for short, as an acronym. And um, essentially, GASB has imposed an accounting funded status number, and it's, it's strange in a lot of ways in what it does. But one of the biggest ways it's different from the actuarial number, the 54.6%, is it says that for plans where budgets have been tight and maybe full funding hasn't been available in recent years because of tight budgets, you have to assume a worst case scenario that you're never gonna get full funding. And if you're never gonna get funding, at some point, obviously, you're gonna run out of money, and at that point, you're just gonna have cash. So they're saying, Gatsby's saying, you're not going to be able to count on those investment earnings to pay for the lion's share of benefits, assume a worst case scenario. That's why you see such a much smaller number. Actuaries will tell you to ignore it, and I'll tell you to forget it. I did want to explain it. The percentage below that, 21.9%. That is the funded status for the medical insurance fund because you have the pension fund and you have the medical insurance fund. There's two separate funds. And that medical insurance fund pays for retired teachers' health insurance. Now, a lot of people look at the 21.9% and say, boy, that didn't look very good. But actually, that's a great, great news story. In two slides from now, I'm gonna tell you why that is a fantastic story for teachers in the Commonwealth. Here's the, these next two slides are great news slides. Great news, okay? So, Let's just talk about funding, okay? Uh, TRS has needed additional funding. Most recently, it began with the 06-08 budget biennium. Budgets are enacted for two years, every even-numbered year. And we needed an additional $42 million in that budget biennium. And it was available then. But we know what happened. We had the 2008 Great Recession. The economy tanked. Revenue dried up. Budgets were awful. There are so many important needs out there in the Commonwealth and so little revenue to pay for them, the Commonwealth struggled to be able to provide funding for TRS. Plus, we had this issue with health insurance. I'm going to talk about the next slide that was really dangerous because health insurance, retired teachers' health insurance, was in peril. It looked like it was going away. 
So we had another big issue we had to deal with. It got fixed in 2010, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, we know the economy was slow to recover after the Great Recession. I mean, it's a cataclysmic event. You have to go back to the Great Depression to find something else, a, a, a market downturn, an upheaval, uh, and, and just disruption to the economy that we've had with the 2008 Great Recession. But this is the great news, and it's fantastic news. And everybody in this room who is either an active or retired member can be very thankful for this. And as in the current budget, that's the 2016 to 2018 budget that ends June 30, 2018, Wonderful news. Uh, for the first time since 2006, 2008, we got additional funding for the pension fund. We requested $1 billion, $30 million, and we received $973 million of that. That's a huge number. That's 94% of all the additional funding we requested. And we are very thankful to the governor and the members of the General Assembly for putting that money into our retirement system, because it's a complete game changer. It not only helps, and we need this additional funding, uh, it's to help us pay off that unfunded liability. Without this, we are still getting more money than we need just to, for the normal cost of the system. Some of the money we were getting in before this would help pay down or help go towards the unfunded liability, but it wasn't enough. We need additional, again, to make the full mortgage payment to pay off that unfunded liability over 30 years. So not only does this help us start paying off that unfunded liability is a big step. It also helped us with investments because we had extreme negative cash flow issues before we got this additional money. That meant that we didn't have money coming in, so we were having to sell assets sometimes, sometimes when we didn't want to, sometimes when the markets were in decline, so maybe we have to sell an asset that's undervalued and we're selling it at a loss. But that's all changed now. That's all changed. And this money that we're getting in, this $973 million, perfect timing. We're getting it in $125 million increments starting July 1st, 2016, and every three months thereafter. The timing on that couldn't have been better because we're getting that when the markets are getting hot again, and we're making a lot of money off this $973 million. So, again, I'm, I'm very thankful. Uh, the governor put some additional money in the budget for this, and then the General Assembly added even more, a lot more, uh, for, the, for your retirement system. Here's the other. There's the second great news slide. This slide is all about retired teachers' health insurance. So, retired teachers' health insurance got in trouble. It got in trouble because it was established on a pay-go basis back in 1964. Dollars in, dollars out. It wasn't a pre-pump funded benefit. That worked fine in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It started to not look so good in the 90s and by the 2000s it was untenable. It was going to go away or at least largely go away. It looked bad solutions uh, didn't look uh, very apparent. But the great news is that a very successful piece of legislation was enacted that has now preserved this important benefit. It's now no longer a pay-as-you-go benefit, a benefit which never had even 4% of all the assets it needed to pay for all the liabilities. It is now marching towards being a pre-funded benefit where one day it will be 100% funded and investment earnings will help pay for more and more of that benefit. So you can see this, and we call it shared responsibility. And you all are probably aware, active teachers, as part of shared responsibility, started phasing into paying an additional 3% out of their paycheck into this medical insurance fund. That started July 1st, 2010, slowly phased in. The full amount was received July 1st, 2015, for that beginning of that year. School districts match that. Retired teachers under the age of 65 also had a piece of shared responsibility, and that is that they would pay, if they're under 65, they would pay an amount to us, to TRS, that 65 and older retirees pay to federal Medicare for their Medicare Part B premium. That's $134 a month our teachers, retired teachers under age 65, are paying to TRS right now. And then the Commonwealth, um, they, they're, they're picking up the cost of all new retirees under the age of 65, those who retired on after July 1, 2010. They also, and, and I'll go ahead and address this right now because I think this is the source of uh, a rumor that I hear quite often, and that is uh, the pension fund was raided and used for other projects, that that didn't happen. I, I hear that usually everywhere I go. What did happen is before, before 2010, when it, we were having trouble funding retired teachers' health insurance. As a short-term solution, the Commonwealth would use some of the contributions before they got to the pension fund, 
Once they're in the pension fund, they can't be taken out. But before those contributions got to the pension fund, would allocate a portion of those to the medical insurance fund in an amount to pay for those two years retired teachers' health insurance. The Commonwealth was paying that back on an installment basis with interest, okay? So there was that, there was a, there was a, they were fulfilling that obligation to repay the pension fund, but we all knew it was a short-term solution. We had to find a long-term solution because the Commonwealth was stacking up debt. But anyway, 2010, the other thing the Commonwealth did is they issued a $469 million bond. Instead of doing installment payments, they just repaid that pension fund in full. So there's no outstanding balance for the pension fund. There are no dollars that were borrowed or taken out of the pension fund for other projects. But you can see uh, that with the active teachers, the retired teachers, the school districts, and the Commonwealth all coming together with that agreement back in 2010, what happened? In 2009, the funded status was 3.5%. You can see it was never anything before then. But look how quickly it's grown in just a few short years. So here we are, June 30th, 2016, it's already grown to 21.9%. That's fantastic. It's growing very strong. The funding's in there. So this benefit has been preserved. This is sort of a recap uh, of some of the numbers I've shown you, but uh, sometimes I read in the papers and it sounds like contributions and budgets for the retirement systems, all those dollars sort of go in a dark hole or are never seen again. Of course, that's not true. We, we take your contributions and the uh, uh, Commonwealth's contributions and we invest those and we grow those over the career of a teacher. And the great news is when that teacher retires, they come back out in a form and a benefit. And those benefits are paid out in every county in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which is a great economic stimulus for the Commonwealth. So again, the $166 million a month just in the pension, an additional $24 million in medical insurance, and 89% of Kentucky retired teachers stay in Kentucky. So 89% of that stays in the Kentucky and is filtered out and distributed throughout every county in the Commonwealth. In fact, in a lot of counties, if the te uh, retired teacher payroll were considered the payroll of a private employer, it would be the second largest employer in the county. Uh, and this just kind of shows it broken down uh, by distri district. You know, the second district there, for example, $285 million, 8,100 recipients. Um, summer retirement season, okay. So we're getting a whole lot of calls from reporters, and open records request. You know, are you all seeing a spike in retirements because, you know, Superintendent Estes talked about, we've had this study on the retirement systems, and there's talk about pension reform. And for us, uh, our summer retirement season, teachers retire at the end of the year. July is our busiest retirement month. June is the second busiest month and August the third. So at TRS, we have not seen a spike in retirements this up for June and July. And here are the numbers. You see, uh, in fact, 2017 is a little down from 2018. Nor have we seen a spike in visitors. And again, uh, 2017 is just a slightly down from 2016. I've also looked at the August numbers and the September numbers uh, for the retirements, and the August and September numbers are not out of line for the, our retirees. Now, visitors, we did see a spike in visitors in August. We had 622 visitors in August of this year compared to 525 last year, and that 525 last year was, represents a spike in prior years. Also, we are getting a lot of calls with our information center and, and with staff, uh, just asking questions about what's going on. This is a very interesting slide to me. Uh, this slide shows the age at which retirees retire. So each one of these orange bars represents an age for the most recent retirement season, you know, the 2017 season. And, and what is the most common age at which people retire? And you see one column really stands out. It's this one. That's age 55. By far is the most common age at which our retirees retire. And that's not coincidence. Um, there's a reason for that. And that is because many years ago our board saw that we had teachers who were retiring as soon as they got 27 years. We had many teachers retiring in their early 50s. 
And that wasn't really good for the teacher because a lot of them were retiring before they had really fully built up a retirement that could take care of them for the rest of their lives. And it wasn't good for the retirement system because we were paying out retirement allowances years earlier than we really needed to be paying them out. So our board, which has always been very proactive, said, okay, to try to encourage those folks to teach longer and not retire in their early 50s, they uh, had implemented uh, that if you are at least, uh, have at least 27 years of service at retirement, you're at least age 55 at retirement, your retirement allowance is calculated on your three highest rather than your five highest salaries. So what this chart shows is that incentive worked, that the carrots can work to hold people in to the classroom longer. Again, that's better for the member. They build up a more significant retirement, and it's good for the system because we've delayed paying retirement allowances years earlier than we other would, otherwise would have. A uh, couple of things. As you're aware, teachers can retire with 27 years of service. So, yes, you can have a teacher who graduates from college at age 22 and retires at age 49. That doesn't happen very often, though. Uh, in fact, less than 5% of our retirees retire below age 50, less than 5%. Four times as many of our retirees retire at age 60 or older. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those a little bit later in another slide. Uh, you can see our average retirement age uh, for this last uh, retirement uh, season was 59. This is our board. This is our board. Your, this is your board. This is your board of trustees. We have an 11 member board. Active and retired teachers elect seven of these members. Okay. Uh, four are active teachers. One's a retired teacher. Two are lay trustees. One's a former bank president. One's a current bank president. That's Mr. Ron Sanders up here, who's our, the chair of our board of trustees. We also have serving on the board ex officio the state treasurer, Allison Ball, and we also have uh, Stephen Pruitt, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Education, who serves ex officio on our board. And very recently, as a result of legislation that was enacted uh, in this last session, and that was Senate Bill 2, and Senator Bowen was the sponsor for that bill, uh, and that bill did a number of things. It uh, codified and statute certain policies and procedures for retirement systems, and it's provided some clear standardizing language uh, for retirement systems to follow and to implement. Uh, it's a good bill. And it also added uh, two board members uh, to our board of trustees, so we're gone from a nine to 11 member board. Uh, those board members are appointed by the governor, confirmed by the Senate, and they are required to have investment expertise. So you have Mr. John Boardman up here, upper right-hand corner from Lexington, and Mr. Frank Kalecchia from Louisville. And they've already attended two board meetings and one investment committee meeting, and they're good additions for uh, the retirement system, for your retirement system. They're qualified investment professionals, uh, and we welcome them uh, to our, our, as an addition to our existing investment staff. And they're, they're meshing very well with their investment staff. They kind of speak the same language. So it's, it's a good bill. It was an improvement, and we appreciate Senator Bowen's efforts with that bill. And also, uh, Senator Bowen, I will tell you, was very open. He had his door open always to the retirement system when we had questions or concerns about what that bill ultimately looked like. So we appreciate him being very open-minded and having his door open for us to talk to him about that. Board. Now, that board has done a great job. That board has managed your retirement system in a very efficient manner at low cost. And I'm going to have some more slides to show that. But it's done a great job. And that hasn't happened everywhere else in the country. Some boards and other country, uh, pension plans uh, across the country have not done such a good job. And I've been there since 1999, and I'm really proud of the job that your board has done. Uh, again, when I first started working in the retirement system, the average retirement age was 54. It's now increased to 59, which is, is quite phenomenal, really. Uh, to make that kind of a turnaround from an actuarial standpoint, that's huge. And that happened uh, because uh, the board institute policy, like the, you know, the high three, they tightened up return to work conditions. We have a, a very uh, uh, serious effort to try to educate our members about just because you have 27 years of service, 
you can file a retirement application does not mean you are necessarily financially ready to file a retirement application. But here's some other things that our board did. Um, across the country, there was something called placement agents that was very common. And placement agents were brokers. They're like brokers. Uh, and so they would try to get business with pension funds uh, for money manager clients, for investment manager clients. And that's legal, but lots of times, not lots of times, but there were many occasions of pay to play that was involved. So there was risk there with using or doing business with investment managers who were using these outside parties to try to get your business. So TRS has not and does not do business with individuals uh, who use placement agents or pay, make any kind of third party payments to try to get our business. The other thing we've avoided is hedge funds. TRS has never been invested in hedge funds. Uh, return to work made actually sound, I've already talked about that, but you know, you know what's, there, there's a breaks in service, there's a limitation on income that can be earned in a TRS covered position when a retiree returns to work uh, and, and other conditions that they have to follow. There's a limitation on how many full-time people can go back to work. Of course, most of our return to work individuals, most of our people who retire and return to work are substitute teachers, overwhelmingly. It's substitutes going back in the classroom. Airtime costs made actuarially sound. Um, so, in 1998, uh, uh, a provision or an opportunity became available for state employees and teachers, whereby they could buy up to five years of service and retire five years earlier. So somebody with 22 years of service could buy five years of service and go ahead and retire. The problem with that, and uh, I'm not revealing any secrets here because this has been uh, testified to in, in public hearings many times, was that while your board, TRS, required that the full actual cost for those purchases be paid, KRS did not. In fact, they, they charge much, much, a fraction of what we were charging. So our active teacher trustees would go back to the classroom. They would hear from their peers who had talked to the classified staff who had just bought their five years at a fraction of the cost that the teacher was being charged, and they were mad at our teachers. Our, our teacher trustees. But our teacher trustees stood their guns and said, no, it's the right thing to do. We've got to charge the full cost or we're going to be losing money. And it was the right thing to do. And, and, and KRS has raised their, their cost of this purchase twice since the initially came out. Also, uh, cost of living adjustments. Uh, you probably read about it. This is public to the KRS had some unfunded cost of living adjustments. Uh, we do not at TRS, okay? There's a 1.5% cost of living adjustment that's built into statute. Okay, it's, it's you get, the retirees get every July 1st. Uh, it's a pre-funded cost of living adjustment. Part of the contribution made by teachers, part of the contribution made by the employers go to fund this. So a teacher is paying for this 1.5% COLA all their life. And why do they have it? Because we're a Social Security replacement plan. Uh, Social Security typically provides COLAs, uh, typically provides COLAs that are greater than 1.5% on average. And as a Social Security replacement plan, we have to provide our teachers some measure of cost of living adjustment. Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't have any means of having uh, any increases in their retirement to keep pace with inflation. This is just the ballot. You get to vote. You get this. And you vote in May for your, our trustees or staggered terms. So you can vary from two to one uh, trustees that you will vote for each May. This is... Um, Sometimes I hear that, you know, well, this is a page behind the box uh, that comes from our uh, annual financial statement, okay? And we have a lot of information in our financial statement. And we have all of our financial statements posted on our website, going back to the very first one. And so this page that's behind the box, uh, basically it lists everybody we do business with to invest our money. We identify them. And we also identify how much we're paying them. And so, uh, again, this is available for anybody to see. You can see that for our uh, investment costs, what we pay to invest your money, it's 29 hundredths of one percentage point. That's very, very cheap. It's hard to find anybody else in the country that's doing better than that. And our outside investment experts, we have a couple of uh, outside investment experts that we had before the new board appointments uh, from New York. They're always amazed at how cheap uh, we're able to negotiate uh, cheaply these fees. 
This is administrative expenses. So instead of investment expenses, these are the administrative expenses. This is how much it costs to operate the system. Um, and, and again, very cheap, cheaply operated uh, at TRS. The top line Kentucky teachers, 0.0556%, okay? Very cheap. And then we just put in some similarly sized retirement systems uh, that are all more expensive than TRS. Uh, we did throw in Ohio Teachers Retirement System, which is bigger than we are, but they manage a medical insurance, retired, retired teachers' health insurance, just like we do, which is added ex, uh, ex administrative expense. One thing about TRS I find interesting, there's a lot of continuity over there. We don't have a lot of turnover. So again, we've had our doors open for business for 77 years, and during that time, there have only been five executive secretaries. We've also had very low turnover in chief investment officers. That allows us to adhere to a, a uniform, consistent policy with operating the system and with investing your money. Here's the uh, slide on historical investment returns. So just to go over these very quickly, this is of June 30, 2017. One-year returns, again, 15.37% gross, 15.02% when you subtract out the fees we pay, top 8% in the country. Three-year return, 6.3%, top 11% in the country. Five-year return, 10.1%, top 13% in the country. Ten-year return, 6.3%, top 9% in the country. I will remind everyone, of course, that 10-year return includes the Great Recession. So even with that significant of a market downturn, we were still were able to achieve 6.3% in that relatively short window of time. And, of course, we focus more on numbers like this, the 30-year return, Ending June 30th, 2016, eight, or 17, I'm sorry, 8.1%. That's our long-term return. This slide gets a lot of attention, okay? What this slide is, is it breaks down the retirement allowances, the pensions that TR is, is paying out right now to all its uh, retirees, and it breaks it down by $5,000 increments. So here on the far left-hand side, that's zero to $5,000. And at the top of this blue bar, there's a white number, 2,466. So we are paying out uh, retirement benefits between less than $5,000 to 2,466 people. Now, obviously, these are not people with a lot of TRS service. They're people who came in late career, maybe taught or worked five years and then retired, or they're people with reciprocity service. But the most significant thing about this chart is that you see there's some bars here right in the middle. These are who our retirees are. This is the face of retired teachers across the Commonwealth. And you can see by far the highest bar here are those folks who are receiving between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 a year in retirement allowance. That's where most of our retired teachers are across the Commonwealth when you see them. Uh, and remember, that has to replace Social Security. So that's, in my opinion, that, that, that's not a, an excessive benefit. See, the next highest benefit is 40 to 45, and the one after that, 30 to 35. That's where the heart, where our, our retired teachers are, this is what they are getting uh, to live on. Now, understandably, uh, the public's attention is not going to be on this. The public's attention is going to kind of go down this way, to this end of the chart to these. You see there aren't many people here at all. You know, one, one, two, one, one, two, two, four, seven, five, six, seventeen. Not many people here. But we do. We have one individual right here who's making between two hundred and two hundred and five thousand dollars a year in retirement. <clears throat> now, I haven't looked up who this individual is. I could, but I don't know who this person is. But I do know for sure three things about this person. One, he or she is not a classroom teacher. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Two, this was a very, very highly compensated individual in public life. They were probably one of the highest paid public employees in the Commonwealth. And we do have five universities in our field of membership, okay? So someone very highly compensated. And the other thing they have to do to get that kind of retirement allowance is not only do they have to be very highly compensated before they retired, they had to work a long time. 
So you see this orange line that starts over here to the left, lower left, and gets up or gets higher and higher? That shows average years of service worked. So for this individual, highly compensated, and he worked 48 years before he drew his retirement allowance. So he worked a long, or she worked a long, long time. That's actually, that's very actually sound for us, because obviously if you're deferring getting retirement benefits for 48 years, um, we're going to pay out that benefit over a shorter period of time. And all along the way, we've had money. They've been contributing a lot of money into the system for us to invest to help pay for that benefit. This is just sort of a recap of uh, some of the things I just covered. And I'll skip that. Uh, I'm about through with my presentation, but just so you all are aware, that there are a lot of ways to keep up with TRS. So we have Facebook. Uh, we have a website. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, and also, we have this member portal for those of you who haven't tried it. So you can access your account online. You can get a password. You can go online. You can see how much service you have. You can see what your reported salaries are. Uh, we have even we have something in there called a, a benefit estimator. So you can plug in your numbers. And it does a pretty good job of giving you sort of a ballpark idea. You plug in numbers, and you tell when you want to retire, uh, and what you anticipate your future salaries to be and all of that, and it will estimate your retirement allowance. Now, it's just a ballpark, and it's not a substitute for getting an official estimate for the retirement system. Nobody should ever make a retirement decision based on this estimator. But I think it is very helpful and very interesting to kind of play with for those of you who maybe don't want to make the trip to Frankfurt yet or call in and get an official estimate, but just kind of want to get an idea where I might be for long-term retirement planning purposes. And that concludes my presentations. I, I will talk just very briefly about where we are now, okay? So again, number one, I say this over and over because it's so true. The additional funding that we got in that last, in the current budget from the governor and the General Assembly is fantastic. It is a complete game changer for us. We're very fortunate to have that. So we're, we've actually, we've implemented the first step towards the solution of paying off that unfunded liability. It's fantastic. And uh, as Superintendent Essie said, we have had PFM, that's the name of the group, that's reviewing the retirement systems. They made a report uh, uh, August 28th uh, to the Public Pension Oversight Board, which is comprised of public and private individuals. And there were some recommendations in there. And I will emphasize what Superintendent Essie said, and I've heard public officials say this very publicly, those are just recommendations. It takes an act of the General Assembly to affect uh, pension reform. So I, I got a lot of calls from folks who were scared about that. Uh, what I will also add is that uh, we've had uh, the governor and members of the General Assembly come out very publicly, and they have said uh, that even though there will likely be a special session for pension reform, which can be called any time, you can pass a bill out in five days, the governor and other members, uh, public members, uh, or the General Assembly, or members of the General Assembly have said that there will be no emergency clause. So that it's not like the governor is going to say, we're going to have a special session next week. We're going to pass a bill out in five days. It'll become effective immediately. And nobody has a decision or a chance to make a decision about the retirement. We've had the governor uh, and members of the General Assembly say publicly that uh, no emergency clause and you active teachers will have time to make an informed decision about your retirement. There's not a need to rush to retirement. So, uh, and I'm afraid we've had some members who have rushed to retirement. I've heard more rumors this year than ever in my uh, 18 years at the retirement system. Uh, I heard that there was, in fact, somebody thought our housekeeping bill was going to do away with sick leave. I know you know what that is. But, uh, and then I heard there's going to be a special session the day after the session. I heard there was going to be significant changes July 1st, July 28th. All these drop-dead dates where all these things were going to happen came and passed, and nothing happened. But the rumor and the uncertainty, I mean, people unfortunately made some bad decisions. So uh, I would urge everyone here who's an active member, who's close to retirement or eligible for retirement, uh, to wait uh, and, and make an informed decision. And, and I don't, I've even heard one ranking uh, uh, member of the General Assembly say that there will be a 30-day review period even before the special session in which uh, active retired 
teacher, particularly active teachers, will have an opportunity to see what is coming, and there will be an opportunity for comment about that. So, uh, again, uh, wait and make an informed decision about your retirement. Again, uh, I'm going to be doing questions and answers here in a few minutes, and I'd encourage anyone with a, any kind of question at all to please ask it. There's no such thing as a bad question. But if, I do want to say, in closing for my prepared remarks, thank you again so much for inviting me down here today uh, to talk to you about your retirement system. If you have any questions you think of after today, just pick up the phone, uh, call me. I'd be glad to talk to you. I talk to active and retired teachers uh, every day. So thank you again so much. Appreciate it.